Dear students, and I mean also students from uh, Maastricht University, from the Faculty of Law, but also from other faculties, and I also mean students participating online. Dear colleagues, colleagues from uh, the law faculty, but also colleagues participating online, and dear guests, including lawyers working in the environmental law practice, welcome. My name is Marian Peters. I coordinate this lecture series and I wholeheartedly welcome you all to this very first lecture, the inaugural lecture to the series Strengthening EU Environmental Law, Legal Perspectives on Greening Europe. Before I give the floor to our lecturer, Professor Faure, I first give the word to our Dean, Professor Jan Smits, to officially open this new lecture series. Thank you so much, Marjan. Um, yes, indeed, very much welcome to everyone present here in this beautiful room uh, and watching uh, uh, online. Um, I will be very short. That's what Marjan also asked me to be. So I will take no more than two minutes, but I really wanted to be here um, on behalf of our Faculty of Law and our university. Um, just to say how much we appreciate the initiative. Um, it's a very special event. It's a very special series of lectures uh, on greening Europe, indeed. That's, I think, the title you didn't mention yet, uh, Marjan. Greening Europe and on strengthening European environmental law. It's timely, it's important, um, and it is, in my view, even uh, vital, both academically, but also, of course, uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the planet. So... Great to see the enthusiasm of all the lecturers, starting with Professor Faure, who will give the inaugural lecture. I thought you gave your inaugural lecture a long time ago, Michael, but you do another one right now in this lecture series. Um, and as I understand, the series is already full until, well, at least 2025. So that also indeed very much shows the enthusiasm of many colleagues willing to uh, speak about this important topic. Um, and many thanks also for the enthusiasm of everyone participating here, uh, attending uh, this first lecture, as I said, both here in the room, but also, uh, uh, also online, with a total of, as I understand, 120 registrations, um, including, in fact, indeed, a large group of, uh, uh, of students. And great, finally, to also see the enthusiasm of the organizers. And there I want to, in particular, thank, of course, Professor Maria Peters, um, and also uh, Brit van Soest and Paul Adriaans and Alejandro, who did a lot of work in actually organizing uh, this event. Um, I think my two minutes are up. Many thanks for doing this and lots of fun with the first lecture. Thank you very much, Jan, that's much appreciated. We now quickly move to the opening lecture or inaugural lecture to be delivered by my colleague, Professor Michael Fahre, Professor of International and Comparative Environmental Law at our law faculty. Michael Fahre is an expert on many themes in the field of environmental law including the enforcement of environmental law. And the enforcement of environmental law is a theme that is too often placed at the end of a book, at the end of a discussion. But we have deliberately decided to start off this lecture series with the theme of enforcing environmental law, and more particularly uh, the developments in European environmental criminal law. By the way, this theme was selected by the students to the master course European Environmental Law through a WooClap poll as one of their favorite topics on which they wanted to hear more. So it's with confidence that I invite Michael to deliver his lecture on European Environmental Criminal Law. Thank you very much. Michael, you have the floor. Thank you, Marianne. Ladies and gentlemen, this afternoon we will talk about a scary topic about environmental crime. 
What I wanted to tell you is that the issue that I'm talking about this afternoon is something serious. Just look at this little overview. What you see here is an impression of the costs of environmental crime. This comes from UNEP. So here we are talking about data on a worldwide basis. Just look a little bit. Of course, these are always estimates, but still illegal fisheries, the cost could go up to 24 billion. And these are costs on a yearly basis. Then if you look at the forestry crimes, it would go up to 152 millions. And so you see these are pretty serious numbers. Now that is worldwide. But if you would look at the numbers for Europe, there we have the intellectual property office that also estimated the costs of environmental crime. And they came also to scary amounts, annual cost between eight and 26 billions. And if you look at the data, you see that there is on average in Europe, according to these estimates by serious people, a cost of 15 billion on a yearly basis. Not only are there high societal costs of environmental crime, there are also high gains for the perpetrators. Again, there are estimates made by Eurojust indicating that the annual revenues from illicit waste trafficking in Europe would amount again to 4 to 15 billion a year. And even things that would look relatively innocent, like for example, the illegal trade in eels, you know, these beautiful snaky like animals, already that can deliver something like between the 4.7 and 31 million a year. Now, if you look at that, what does that indicate? I think it pretty simply shows just a couple of slides with data that on the one hand, environmental crime leads to high costs for society, high social costs in Europe. And at the same time, it also leads to high benefits for the perpetrators. Now, of course, the topic that I'm supposed to talk about today is, is there a task for Europe in this respect? Well, if you would apply the economic perspective that Professor Philips is used to apply to these type of questions, then logically you would say yes. Why? From an economic perspective, there are some criteria for centralization. A first is when there would be cross-border externalities. A second is when there would be a danger of a so-called race to the bottom. Race to the bottom being that there may be a competition between different member states to attract industry and that industry would react to that by a move to those location, uh, locations which would be more beneficial from an environmental perspective. Now the question is, are there those dangers, and in other words, reasons for centralization as far as environmental crime is concerned in Europe? I think it's not so difficult to argue that if you look at waste, you look, for example, at illegal fishing, but also trade in wildlife, that there are definitely cross-border externalities. So that is not difficult to argue. What about the race to the bottom? So that would be, as I mentioned, that member states would be competing to attract industry with either inefficiently low standards or inefficiently low enforcement, and that the industry would react with relocalizing to what we then call the pollution havens, well, you know, the problem is a little bit, we have very little data on that, so we don't know exactly what is going on. But the point is that it is very well possible. It is very likely that that would be happening. In other words, we have pretty strong arguments in favor of a European intervention in the domain of environmental crime, just as a starting point. Now, what did we basically see? What have we seen in Europe? Just a little bit of history. Of course, as we know from the many writings of Marian Peters, there has been a massive development of European environmental law, the so-called uh, EU environmental acquis. Some Dutch scholars made calculations once, and I think they came to thousands of regulatory documents, directives, and regulations. Yet at the same time, they say, although we have a lot of EU environmental law, the big problem that we have is a implementation deficit. In other words, there is a lot of law out there at the EU level, but it is not sufficiently implemented. There is a study by Birdslow arguing that between 78 and 2016, 
there were 2,341 infringement cases, not only arguing, but just showing with data, just related to environmental policy. So by the commission against member states for lacking implementation. And she even asked the question, is this maybe not just the top of the iceberg? In other words, we see a lot of enforcement cases for bad implementation against member states. And if you look at the data, you even see that tragically the environment is the champion. In other words, that is the domain where there is a most serious implementation deficit. Now, if you look at that, what have we seen so far? And so far in my first five minutes, I have on the one hand shown that there is a serious problem with environmental crime. We have huge costs in the EU of environmental crime, but we have on the other hand, also an implementation deficit. These are, I would argue, two good reasons for an involvement of Europe also with environmental crime. But let me say from the outset, it is quite important to realize that those are separate reasons. So you could on the one hand say, okay, I want the European involvement with environmental crime because we want to create a minimum level of environmental criminal law. In other words, we want to fight environmental crime. That is one reason. But the other, and it's very important to realize that's not exactly the same. The other reason would be that you say no, we have an implementation deficit and we find it important to use criminal law as an instrument to fight the implementation deficit. In other words, we want to use it as an instrument to improve implementation. So these are the two reasons that we could use. And of course, you might argue why choose. You may even use them both at the same time. Okay, we have reasons for an EU intervention. But then, of course, in Europe, the question always comes up, was there an EU competence to do so? Well, I say was, why? Well, these questions basically came up in the 1990s, so in the past century. That is when these questions were arising. Well, let's say that that was not that obvious. What was obvious was that there were competences in the domain of environmental policy. In the beginning, that was not obvious either. But let's say that since the single European Act, 1987, and especially since the beautiful treaty of this wonderful city, Maastricht, that it was absolutely clear that there were competences as such in the environmental domain. What was less clear was where, where there were also competences in the domain of criminal law. And so for my hobby, more particularly environmental criminal law. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, it may not be a surprise to you that, in fact, the very first initiative that was taken in Europe with respect to environmental criminal law did not come from the European Union. In fact, it came from the Council of Europe. The Council of Europe drafted what, according to many, including me, was a beautiful convention of 1998 on the protection of the environment through criminal law. What was this convention doing? It provided minimum provisions on the protection of the environment through criminal law. In other words, it went for the first one, the first goal, a genuine protection of the environment. Of course, the Council of Europe had nothing to do with implementation problems. Logically, that was not their cup of tea. We saw a toolbox approach. What does it mean? that you don't only talk about criminal law, but you also respect that there are other instruments like administrative enforcement. You see the criminal law rather as an ultima ratio, ultimum remedium. There is what we call a graduated punishment approach. The more infringements to the environmental harm, to the protected interest, the stronger that the intervention becomes. And there was even very important, an independent crime aiming at serious pollution. Independent meaning you could apply it even if there was no violation of administrative regulations. I will talk more about that later. A beautiful convention, in other words. Unfortunately, with lacking uh, ratifications, this never entered into force. Still, it is an important document, as I will tell you later. Although it never entered into force, it has served as an inspiration, as a source of inspiration for later environmental criminal law, at least for proposals 
that were made in that respect. And I told you already that it made me pretty happy for the reason that it is largely in line with what, for example, German legal doctrine on environmental criminal law was writing. That was the Council of Europe. But what about the European Union? Well, let's put it simply, things were before the Lisbon Treaty very complicated. What do I mean with complicated? We had something funny like a pillar structure, whereby we had in the so-called first pillar, for those of you who may remember that, the possibility to take an initiative by the European Commission to promote the implementation of the acquis. So again, solve implementation deficit. We had in addition also a so-called third pillar. And in the third pillar, you could only take initiatives with respect to justice and home affairs. And when I say you, it was the council and they could make framework decisions. Now, when there are two, let's say actors who have competences, you can also expect that it might be that both of them start and indeed at the very same time. And that is what we saw here. The very first initiative, quite interesting, was in the framework of the so-called third pillar initiative already in 2000, two years after the uh, Council of Europe Convention, initiative by the Kingdom of Denmark. And they proposed in the third pillar an uh, instrument to target serious environmental crime. Again, like the Council of Europe Convention, targeting genuinely environmental crime. Almost at the same time, a year later, there came a proposal from the European Commission, 13th of March 2001, and that was a different one. It was a directive on the protection of the environment through criminal law, but with the goal to have a more effective application of community legislation. They say it clearly if you read the recitals, experience has shown that the sanctions currently established by the member states are not always sufficient to achieve full compliance with community law. Not all member states provide for criminal sanctions against the most serious breaches of community law protecting the environment. In other words, the Commission wants environmental criminal law as an implementation instrument. But the story was not over. After that, again, the Council came within the framework of the so-called third pillar with a proposal for a framework decision on the protection of the environment through criminal law. Now, what you see so nicely in all of these different initiatives is that you can, let's say, make environmental criminal law for different reasons, different purposes, different goals. Indeed, all these so-called third pillar initiatives, Denmark and the framework decision, were aiming at a genuine protection of the environment. And their source of inspiration was the Council of Europe Convention. If you look at the document, they more or less took over the provisions of the Council of Europe Convention. The European Commission has a different worry. They saw criminal law as a tool for an effective application of the environmental acquis. Now, Chair, ladies and gentlemen, when, of course, two different actors, Commission and the Council, take initiative at the same time, we have something that we call a conflict. Where did we go to when there was a conflict? We went to what we then called the European Court of Justice at the time. And of course, the thing was submitted to the European Court of Justice, and they decided on the 13th of September 2005 the following. Although as a general rule, neither criminal law nor the rules of criminal procedure fall within the community competence. The last mentioned finding does not prevent the community legislature when the application of effective, proportionate, and dissuasive criminal penalties by the competent national authorities is an essential measure for combating serious environmental offenses from taking measures which relate to the criminal law of the member states when it, considers, when it is considered necessary in order to ensure that the rules which it lays down on environmental protection are fully effective. In other words, what you basically see here is that the court says, okay, you can do it within the framework of the so-called first pillar. You can force member states towards criminalization. That is basically what it says here. But of course, particular uh, conditions have to be met. It has to be an essential measure 
and it has to be necessary in order to ensure that all the measures are fully effective. <clears throat> in other words, what you clearly see here, as I was mentioning before, this criminal law and the use of criminal law for the commission is clearly an implementation measure. So here, the way that the court allows it is not the protection of the environment as such in the sense of a fight against environmental crime. No, it goes about the implementation of the aki. That is a major worry. <coughs> At some moment, the European Commission got a bit carried away and enthusiastic by this success and made another proposal in which they had included also minimum sanctions. So they prescribed the level and the type of sanctions that had to be imposed by the member states. Again, there was a conflict with the council. I spare you a little bit the details. But then the Court of Justice said, well, that goes a little bit too far to our taste. So there was a second decision by the court in October 2007. And then the court said, by contrast and contrary to the submission of the commission, the determination of the type and level of the criminal penalties to apply does not fall within the community's sphere of competence. So ladies and gentlemen, if we would summarize where we stand, what was the outcome of the conflict? You could say, well, there was green light for creating an environmental crime directive as a result of this case law, when effective, proportionate, and dissuasive criminal penalties are essential, as the court calls it, to combat serious environmental offenses, then you may prescribe criminal law, you may force member states to do that in order to ensure compliance, remember, implementation with the environmental acquis. But little detail, you cannot go too far. There is no competence to determine the type and the level of criminal penalties. So far, so good. So the time was right for the creation of an environmental crime directive. And the directive that we're talking about here is a directive 2001-99 of the 19th of November 2008. A couple of words on how this directive is structured. Article 3 contains particular conducts. There is a long list with a lot of details, not interesting for here. And they say these should constitute a criminal offense, so in the member state law, in the domestic legislation, when unlawful or committed intentionally or at least with serious negligence. So far, so good. And then Article 2 said, what is unlawfulness? Unlawfulness is an act that violates European environmental directives or domestic administrative environmental law implementing the directives. In other words, when you have a breach of regulation, EU level or implementation, that is unlawfulness, that is a criterion for criminal liability. What is also striking is that if you look at that directive, you see that there is a very strong belief in the criminal law. More particularly, if you take the recitals, there is a recital three that says, experience has shown that the existing systems of penalties have not been sufficient to achieve complete compliance with the laws for the protection of the environment. Such compliance can and should be strengthened by the availability of criminal penalties, which demonstrate a social disapproval of a qualitatively different nature compared to administrative penalties or a compensation mechanism under civil law. Now, that is a bit striking because it basically means that there is no talk about, for example, civil remedies or, for example, administrative penalties or administrative fines. The directive only believes in the only solution, criminalization. Now, I can tell you that there has been quite a bit of criticism on this directive for a number of reasons. I just want to pick out uh, three, according to me, of the most important points of criticism. What is the first one? The first is that there is an unlawfulness requirement. What does it mean? It means that there is only criminal liability if you violate regulations or you violate conditions of a permit. 
there is no possibility of a criminal liability in an autonomous manner. You cannot, if there is no violation of administrative regulations, have criminal liability. And even stronger, as long as there is compliance with regulation or with the conditions of a permit, no criminal liability. That is what we call the famous administrative dependence of environmental criminal law. That is the first problem. Second, in member states, we had already for a couple of decades started with what we call a toolbox approach. Toolbox approach means we use a, vi a wide variety of different remedies, different tools, different instruments to environmental harm, the criminal law being only one of them and only coming at the end as an ultimum remedium. And also in many member states, we saw exactly in that period the introduction of administrative penalties, administrative fines. Why did they do that? Because they saw that the criminal penalty only was totally ineffective for the simple reason that it only led to massive dismissals of all of the cases. So this goes contrary to what we saw in the member states and what was prescribed by the literature. The third problem, according to me, is the most serious one. The whole environmental crime directive has no duty on the member states to collect any type of data. What does it mean, ladies and gentlemen? It means that we have no information. For example, on the number of inspectors or inspections, we have no information on installations to be controlled or on the number of violations or on the number of sanctions imposed, let alone on the type and the size of penalties. We feel a little bit like Manuel in Faulty Towers, and we can say we know nothing, absolutely nothing. And that, of course, for the European level, I would say that is rather dramatic. Why? I told you in the beginning, we need environmental criminal law to solve the problem of a race to the bottom. Now we could easily have a situation that one member state could simply implement on paper the environmental crime directive and for the rest does nothing at all, has no inspectors, has no enforcement, has no penalties. The answer was, we don't know. And I think that that makes it absolutely dramatic because it could lead to a race to the bottom between the different member states. And according to me, that has even been the result. Some argue that there is a fourth problem in the Environmental Crime Directive and that is the fact that in the Environmental Crime Directive, remember, the Commission was not allowed to do that, there was no harmonization of the level and the type of penalties. Many scholars say that was dramatic. My answer is no, that is not the main issue. I mean, the more problematic point is that we have no data. We have no idea what's going on in the Member States. Even if all of the penalties would formally be the same, of course, Anyone working with criminal law knows that doesn't mean that in practice also those harmonized penalties will be applied. Why? Logically, we always have discretion. Discretion of the inspection authorities, discretion of the prosecutors and of the judges that is unavoidable and even needed. Ladies and gentlemen, it may come as no surprise to you that in a staff working document of 2020, it was indicated we have problems with the effectiveness of the Environmental Crime Directive. In a sense, this directive did not contribute to reducing environmental crime. What had to be done? Well, ladies and gentlemen, since 2008, when the directive was made, something changed. What changed in 2009? Well, we got the Lisbon Treaty. And the Lisbon Treaty has for environmental criminal law a bit of good news, a bit of bad news. Starting with the bad news, there are the so-called Euro crimes in Article 83.1. Those are wonderful because they allow to establish minimum rules concerning the definition of criminal offenses and sanctions in areas of particular serious crime with a cross-border dimension. You think that's great. And then you come with a list. They say that applies to the following. And then you see for example, money laundering, corruption, counterfeiting, computer crime, and organized crime. All of those are more important than environmental crime. Surprise, surprise. 
So that's the bad news. Environmental crime was not made a euro crime. No separate foundation for actions at the EU level truly to fight against environmental crime. Big problem, as I will tell you later. The little bit of good news, if you like it, is Article 83.2. There is a legal basis now, exactly what the Commission wanted, for minimum rules with regard to the definition of criminal offenses and sanctions in the area concerned. So that possibility was there, but as I told you, I think that that is not really the main issue. But of course, Lisbon opened the road to change the Environmental Crime Directive. So what did we see? And that is a little bit, let's say, the recent evolutions. There is, ladies and gentlemen, a new proposal that was launched by the Commission on the 15th of December 2021. When we look at that proposal, I think when you compare to the old one, there are a couple of strong points. What are the strong points? I think, for example, that the toolbox approach is now introduced. It is no longer that only the criminal law is the most effective remedy and that they forget about all the others. You see, for example, in the recital 22, that they say judicial and administrative authorities in the member states should have at their disposal a range of criminal sanctions and other measures to address uh, different types of criminal behavior in a tailored and effective manner. And if you look also in an Article 5 on the penalties for natural persons, you see a long list of other remedies that can be imposed. For example, temporary bans on running for elected or public office, withdrawal or, of permits and authorizations, disqualifications. So that made me happy. Except finally, we have a lot of instruments in the toolbox, not only the criminal law. There were more things that made me happy. The second one is finally they saw that data are important. They listened well to us, Niels. And indeed, if you look at the result, there is now a real stress on the importance of data. The one that I really talk about is Article 21. Now member states are forced to collect statistical data inter alia on the number of environmental crime cases, average lengths of the investigations, convictions, number of persons convicted, cases dismissed, types and level of sanctions. That is all good, positive, and can lead to substantial improvements. There is a third issue, and for me, it's a bit debated. It, it makes very many people very excited, not me. And that is that in this proposal, there is also a harmonization of sanctions. But at the same time, it reads literally in recital 14, that all of this harmonization of sanctions is, of course, without prejudice to the discretion of judges or courts in criminal proceedings. So I tell you honestly, ladies and gentlemen, don't expect too much of this harmonization of sanctions. I consider this typically a wonderful example of symbol politics. It looks very good, but whether that will mean that anything changes, I have strong doubts. There is, Chair, ladies and gentlemen, another problem. There are, according to me, in this proposal, still major weaknesses. Remember what I told you about the previous directive, that we have this important problem being that unlawfulness is always required. How does it look now? Well, the problem is, if you look at the new directive in Article 3, unlawfulness is still required. But then if you look at the definition of unlawfulness, they had something brilliant. In Article 2, they say, aha, the conduct shall be deemed unlawful even if carried out under an authorization by a competent authority in a member state, and then it comes, when the authorization was obtained fraudulently or by corruption, extortion, or coercion. Yeah, I thought that's very romantic, that's very nice, but at the same time, very naive as well. How are you ever going to show that this, uh, uh, that this permit has been obtained with coercion, corruption, or extortion? So again, looks nice on paper, wonderful uh, symbol politics, practical effect, according to me, almost zero. But then you say, Michael, wait a moment. There are good things in this proposal. 
if you look in the recitals, they say, no, 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 no. We have also aggravating circumstances. And some of the aggravating circumstances resemble a little bit of what is a very popular topic today, being ecocide. Everyone talks about ecocide nowadays, and they want to introduce it at the level of the International Criminal Court. Also here, it plays a role. The uh, recital 16 explicitly said there can be an environmental criminal offense which causes substantial and irreversible or long-lasting damage to an entire ecosystem. This should be an aggravating circumstance because of its severity, including in cases comparable to ecocide. I almost get emotional when I read it. And I say, this is, this, this is excellent. I get excited. And indeed, you look in Article 8, and then you say aggravating circumstances. When the environmental crime causes death or serious injury to a person, or when you have this ecocide. But then, venenum in cauda est, the devil is in the detail. What did they forget? That all of these aggravating circumstances are only applicable when there is unlawfulness. In other words, what does it mean? You can cause the death of a person, you can cause ecocide, as long as you comply with the conditions of a permit, there is no criminal liability. That is simply the consequence. Now, if you think that it's worse, and if you think that it's bad, which I think, just look at what the council did. You know, proposal made by the commission, then it goes to the council. On the 9th of December, the council just make it worse. That stupid little exception of when authorization was obtained fraudulently or by corruption, extortion, or coercion, that's even struck out. Don't know why, but it's kicked out. And as an aggravating circumstance, causing death or serious injury to a person is also kicked out. Fascinating, not important. Okay. Whew, ladies and gentlemen, I get so emotional and when I read all of this. I think we really have to get back to the beginning. What the hell is going on here? Let's sit down for a moment and let's now reflect upon everything that we have been saying. Don't you think, Chair, that that's always important? What do we see? Remember what I told you in the beginning of my very first sheet. There, I showed that the data shows we have high costs of environmental crime. Environmental crime leads to huge social costs in the EU. But there is something else. What people don't know is that we have a spectacularly large amount of cases of serious pollution with health damage, where the population suffers from health damage resulting from emissions. What is the problem with all of those cases? We see that the criminal law cannot intervene. Why? These cases happen with the coverage of a permit. Just a couple of examples in the Netherlands. Tata Steel. Other example, Gemours Dupont in Belgium, Umicor. I can give you examples from Bulgaria, Italy, Romania as well. These cases appear on the evening news. And then we see the director of these companies appearing. And the journalists are asking, but what are you going to do about it? And you know what their answer is? We comply with the conditions of a permit. And as a result of that, no criminal liability is possible. Now, I think that this is unacceptable. And that if we want a truly effective environmental criminal law, we need to get rid of that concept of unlawfulness for those very serious pollution cases. Criminal liability should also be imposed, according to me, in, let me be clear, exceptional cases, exceptional cases of serious environmental crime, environmental pollution, leading to a concrete danger to human health even when those emissions would be covered by a permit. Chair, ladies and gentlemen, what we need, according to me, is very simply autonomous environmental crimes. What am I talking about? What do I mean? We need criminal liability to be applicable also in the exceptional cases of serious environmental pollution. What do I mean with serious environmental pollution? For example, when emissions cause Concrete damage to human health. There are cases, some of the cases I mentioned, 
where children suffer harm as a result of lead poisoning. Nothing is done through criminal law because it is all covered by a permit. I think that there is also a foundation, a justification for why we don't want the permit to be an excuse in those cases, why the permit should not pro uh, longer provide a shield. It's very simple. An administrative authority, an administrative permit, should never be able to justify those type of harms, which in fact amount to human rights violations. The cases we see there constitute violations in the sense of Article 2 and Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. So I think that there it is very important that we accord an independent protection via the criminal law to the environment and to human health. The reason I think it is important is because of a signaling effect. Now, these directors appear in the evening news and say, I, com I comply with the permit, that's all I have to do. Obviously, there is a regulatory failure here. And the, my colleagues from administrative law would then answer, yes, Michael, the problem is that we need administrative review. I said, of course we need that, but apparently it didn't happen. And that is why during 20, 25 years, these pollution cases continue. If we now signal to the operators, you remain criminally liable, at least you could be criminally liable, if you comply with the conditions of a permit, you still need to have attention whether your emissions do not cause serious danger, concrete danger to human health. I think that that as such is not a strange thing to say. The major advantage of my proposal, autonomous environmental crime, is it provides incentives to do further research on further reducing the emissions and, and moreover, preventing human rights violations, because that's what we're talking about here. Ladies and gentlemen, this is also not so revolutionary. What I propose here already exists. Remember, I told you so enthusiastically about the Council of Europe Convention. Council of Europe Convention has an article 21A. It says it has to criminalize the discharge, emission, or introduction of a quantity of substances or ionizing radiation into air, soil, or water, which, one, causes death or serious injury to a person, or two, creates a significant risk of causing death or serious injury to a person. Ladies and gentlemen, when these conditions are fulfilled, then the criminal law, according to the convention, intervenes without any requirement of unlawfulness. So when these conditions are fulfilled, we simply see that we have an autonomous environmental crime. There are also in many uh, member states, for example, in Germany, Article 330A of the Staatsgesetzbuch is an autonomous environmental crime. In other countries, Spain, Italy, France, we see examples as well. It can be done. Of course, I recall, when I talk about autonomous environmental crime, it should be something exceptional. Normally, compliance with permit should mean that you have no criminal liability, only in exceptional cases. When there is serious pollution causing concrete danger to human health, then the criminal law should still intervene, according to me. But of course, now I come back to for what reason do we need the criminal law? When you accept that we need an autonomous environmental criminal provision, that also means that we need the criminal law not only as an implementation instrument, but that it should go a lot further and that we should also need criminal law as a genuine instrument. And then, of course, the elephant in the room is back there again. The, the question of the competence that we had in the 1990s is, in fact, not solved. Why? Well, you could rightly tell me, Michael, is there in fact a competence to create an autonomous environmental crime in a environmental crime directive? And then there may be a problem if you say you introduce an environmental crime where you say autonomous environmental crime and then there is no breach of the environmental acquis. And remember, in fact, we, can, we don't have Article 30. Uh, 831. Remember, that is a problem. Environment is not a Euro crime, so we don't have any legal basis 
just to create environmental crimes like that. No, we need a breach of the environmental acquis, and then we can use the criminal law to back up the implementation. That is the whole problem. Now, I think that if you are smart, and lawyers are by definition smart, you can solve this. And then you simply say, we still require a breach of the environmental acquis, but then you explicitly say that when there is serious environmental pollution or ecocide, that in those cases, compliance with a permit does not provide a permit shield, and that there is still criminal liability. Or remember what I told you. In fact, these cases of concrete danger to human health mean that you are potentially violating human rights. That means that also the, fundament, the Charter on Fundamental Rights might provide you a foundation and a legal basis. But you see, again, that this whole issue of what is the purpose of the intervention, and that, that remains very important. Now, on all of these issues, ladies and gentlemen, we are thinking as we speak. But, Chair, my dear Marianne, you know that by the end of the day, I think it is important that we think fundamentally and out of the box about the question, what do we really need to make environmental criminal law in Europe effective? And you know, there is this famous song that says, you may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. Do you mind if I dream a little bit? I will tell you my dreams. Here they come. Imagine, imagine that we include environmental crimes in the list of Euro crimes. Wouldn't that be beautiful? Because then all my problems with finding a fundament, a legal foundation, disappear like today, the snow disappeared in front of the sun. But Marianne, you could answer to, to me, you may call me a dreamer. Because look at the conditions for this. We need, according to 83.1, unanimity in the Council and previous consent of the European Parliament. That Parliament I still trust, but that we would ever get that through the Council, I'm not very optimistic. Imagine that we introduce an autonomous criminal provision for the exceptional cases of serious pollution amounting to ecocide. Again, you may say I'm a dreamer because there will be strong opposition from the industry lobby who will say, as long as we comply with the conditions of a permit, no criminal liability. Imagine that we solve all of the implementation problems very simply, how our American friends have done it. We simply say that we have at the European level, a European protection agency that gets powers to directly go to the member states and control compliance with the environmental acquis. Not such a strange idea. We do it, for example, in the area of competition law. We do it in fisheries. Why would that be impossible in the domain of environmental law? Of course, you may say I'm a dreamer for the simple reason that the member states will react and say, that's against our sovereignty. You take our sovereignty away. If you come with Eurocrats directly in our in, in, here and control, I say, okay, okay. If you don't like that, I have something else. You know, if you don't like that the EU directly comes to the member states, then at least if you take environmental crime seriously, what you should accept is that the European level controls the inspections and the inspectorates in the member states. So that we say, we go from, let's say, uh, Latvia to Greece and to Ireland, and we control what are you doing, how many people do you have, and what are the inspections you're doing. And of course, Marianne, the answer may be, yes, but we don't know what the criteria are. Can you define smart enforcement? We have no harmonized criteria for an effective enforcement system. Then I say, ho, 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 we have that already 22 years. It's true. In 2001, there was again, and according to me, brilliant recommendation made, providing minimum criteria for environmental inspections in the member states. I would recommend read that once. It's really a wonderful document. It tells you in detail how smart enforcement should be organized and how an effective inspection system 
for environmental crime should be organized. Then you answer, Michael, why ha has it not happened? Well, very simple, because it's a recommendation and the recommendation has never been followed. So there, my answer is very simple. If you want effective inspection, very simple, turn that recommendation into a, into a directive and that problem is solved as well. Now, Marianne, you may say I'm a dreamer, but I believe that some of these dreams that I presented to you should be taken seriously. Because I think otherwise, there is a big danger that environmental crime will prevail. There might still be large differences between the member states as far as the enforcement of the environmental acquis is concerned. And thus, according to me, we may still have the danger of a race to the bottom, which was exactly the economic problem that environmental criminal law was supposed to solve. I come, Chair, to some concluding remarks. I think that, as you understand, criminal law can play a limited, but according to me, an important role in the toolbox of instruments to fight environmental crime. I think it can play, on the one hand, a modest but important role to enforce the environmental acquis, as my title suggested. That was my question. But my argument is it should do more than merely solving implementation problems. I think criminal law should also be used as a genuine remedy against environmental crime. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you look at the new proposal, it takes important steps in the right direction. But what is the big problem? Today, the effectiveness of EU environmental criminal law is still totally dependent on whether the member states really want to take the fight against environmental crime seriously. My message this afternoon to you is clear. I think that it is imperative that environmental crime should finally be taken seriously. Why? This will allow us to achieve an effective protection of the environment and human health within the European Union. Thank you so much, Michael, uh, for this excellent lecture, explaining to us how complicated it is to build this supranational uh, framework of environmental um, uh, criminal law. And um, indeed, uh, it is about taking human health and the environment seriously in order to build uh, environmental crime. And uh, it was also fascinating to see how you could uh, include some famous um, songs in your lecture uh, from Super Trump and John Lennon with Imagine, indeed. Well, let's hope that some of the dreams will come true. Uh, 